some of you might have heard me before. But you'd be pleased to know I've never done this speech before. So hopefully there's something in it for everybody. Um, so uh, I've called it We Need a Deadline. Um, and every story needs a middle, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So I thought I would share this with you. So that's me, 30 years ago. Yeah, just look exactly the same, I know. Um, so in 1985, I started working in the online sector. Um, I worked for an organization called TTNS, um, part of the News Corporation Group. Um, we were helping children to communicate with each other online, and I was um, the person who worked out the projects about what they did. My title was National Database Manager. Um, so 1985, for those of you who are keeping track, was before the World Wide Web was invented. Um, so I was doing a little bit of research, and um, I found this quote from this futurologist uh, called Ray Hammond. Now that day has arrived, the humble school micro provides a gateway to a world of knowledge so vast that it is breathtaking at its first acquaintance. So in the last 30 years, we've seen our society transformed immensely, the way that we work, we collaborate, um, the number of people and opportunities I found just being on Twitter, for example, didn't exist back then. And the way we live 24-7, shopping, banking, social contact, and of course it makes paying tax that little bit less painful. I thought Matt Hancock this morning was very positive. Um, he said he wanted to make services better as well as cheaper through digital, and I believed him. I thought his tone was very positive, and I believe he's a minister who gets digital. But if they, this is what Ray Hammond saw in um, 1985. And even, you could say, Rupert Murdoch saw that there was a business in this thing called online communications. Why, in 2015, do we live in such a divided society? In 2015 in the UK, if you're born poor, you will die poor. That's what um, the Commission for Social um, Inclusion and Child Poverty says. We have more than a million people eating out of food banks, and we know through the network that we support that every day people are having essential money, welfare benefits cut, because they don't know how to use the internet to search for jobs and use the universal job match. We live in a divided nation, and digital exacerbates that. It isn't right that over 10 million people's lives are poorer and harder because they don't and can't use the internet. I've met people um, in UK online centres who have told me that they are alive because that local community organisation has helped them to get those first steps on a basic digital skills journey. We often talk about transformation, and I believe the ministers, when they say they want to transform government and they want to transform public services through digital, but actually saving people's lives is really important. We have a great sector. There's loads of people here, and I think one thing I love about working in this sector is that so many people from the public, private, and the whatever we're supposed to call it now, voluntary community, third civil society sector, I quite like third sector myself, um, are all here because every sector cares about this agenda. But we need a better plan. I am absolutely with Martha. We need a more ambitious plan. Um, and we need to get moving. So, since it's Nostalgia Day, um, those two boys up in the little... Some of these boys are my sons. In fact, four of them are, although there are only two of them, if you get my meaning. Um, so, they're Max and Theo on the left-hand side. Um, the older one, Max, is absolutely football mad. And when he was little, we had the uh, great pleasure of spending a lot of very cold Sunday afternoons watching him play football. If any of you have watched small children play football, then you'll completely understand the metaphor I'm about to give you. They basically kick a ball and run. There's no space, there's no tactics, there's no strategy. It's just, look, there's a ball, let's run after it. And I'm sad to say that I think that's what this sector's like, you know? We all think there's a good idea, and off we go. Um, Rachel started well this morning, suggesting that we should eradicate digital exclusion, the gender imbalance in the tech sector, and poor digital skills 
just for a few things, um, by 2025, by the time of the 20th National Digital Conference. But I want to just take one of those um, digital exclusion, as you would expect me to, um, and to set ourselves a more ambitious um, deadline of 2020, and to make sure that by 2020 we don't live in a digitally divided nation. When I'm preparing this speech, I assume you've, almost all of you have heard me speak before, but just in case some of you haven't, Tinder Foundation, we're great. We're a social enterprise and staff-owned mutual. We work with 5,000 um, hyper-local community organisations, public libraries um, and community centres, most of them. And together, in the last five years, we've helped over 1.5 million people to use the internet. We also work with amazing national partners, and again, most of you, lots of you are in the room here today. And the big things we do, the Learn My Way learning platform and online courses, Get Online Week, which is in October, and if one thing that you do is be a partner in Get Online Week, and we also give out around £3 million worth of grant funding each year for digital inclusion projects. So, together, let's close the digital divide by 2020, and I have four ideas. It's a bit of a theme, isn't it? So, stop looking for the silver bullet. I'm not saying we know everything, but we know a lot. Yeah? So, we know what works. We know that community-based support and help that's personalised with great leadership and guidance from organisations like mine, but from many others, it works. Simply more investment of the things that we know works will help more people. And as Martha said earlier today, it's only a fool who can't do the maths that for every pound we invest in getting people basic digital skills, we are going to reap hundreds of pounds back to the British economy, and we'll do it quickly as well. We don't have to wait um, for a lot of time. So just more investment. So I think employers could do more. Um, thank you to Lloyds Banking Group, Vodafone, Talk, Talk BT and others who work closely with us and our partners um, around digital inclusion. That's really, really valuable. But every employer employs people. We're looking at um, going, at pr the proposal is going to our board next week, and I hope that we will become a living wage um, accredited employer. Because obviously we are anti-inequality. We want to make sure that we've got that statement on our website to say every single person who works for Tinder Foundation receives the living wage and every contractor that works for a contract from Tinder Foundation gets a living wage. So how about a digital basic employer accreditation or an investors in digital people? So the employers can publicly state that they are an employer where all of their staff and all of their contractors have got basic digital skills. It's a captive audience. Every company will have a training budget, so let's just get on with it. And we have to make sure that contract staff are included too, such as cleaners, security staff, and catering staff, because I think a lot of employers go, oh, well, all of my people, they're fine, yeah, because they're high-end digital companies, but they don't realise that they will have people in that building who don't have basic digital skills. And I have said this before, and I have said it to Frances Maud a number of times, so now I'm going to have to bang on to uh, Matt Hancock. Let's start with the public sector. You know, if just the government made sure that everybody who worked for the government and every contractor that worked for the government, millions of pounds go to contractors, if they all had basic digital skills, then that would be about a million, probably, of the people that we're looking for. So, I'm a bit stumped by this one. Today on the radio, I heard a woman who's working with one of the charities um, in Calais with the migrants and asylum seekers, um, providing essential support for those people who are sleeping rough and um, hoping to get to the UK. And she said she provided essential services, food, clothing, and phone charges. Are we going to look back and think that we were just foolish thinking that digital infrastructure, that devices and broadband is not a utility? A year ago, 21% of people said that they didn't use the internet because of cost. And as we narrow the digital divide, that divide gets deeper. This year, 32% of people say that they're not online because they can't afford it. And we've got to somehow... What, and we've got to now, and for, for, for all, say that some people just can't afford it. 
It feels too tricky for the government to invest in this. I can see the Daily Mail headlines now. So let's like say there, you know, this one's not for them. They can do some of these other things, but this one's not for them. And therefore, the private sector and the third sector really need to stand up and get counted. And to say if we don't do something about the people who are just too poor to afford it, then we're never going to have a properly digitally included nation. So my fourth one is about the better understanding of the relationship between improved social outcomes and the digital inclusion contribution of that outcome. Last year, we published this report, uh, working with Go On UK, a leading digital nation by 2020, calculating the cost of delivery online, skills for all. It is very good. It probably sounds a little bit dry, but you will enjoy it if you read it. We worked out through that report that actually the cost of getting the last 10.5 million online is only 875 million. And the benefit is 63 billion. But that's not why I wanted to tell you this. I wanted to tell you it because of this. This is a mathematical model built by economist Catherine MacDonald who wrote this report. And one number she came up with isn't about the cost of getting everybody online, but it's how many people are going to be left behind if we do nothing other than all of the amazing stuff we're doing now and all of the investment the government is currently making. 6.2 million people. It's not good enough. So, we need a better understanding of the social outcomes and digital inclusion contribution. So, we know that digital inclusion drives social inclusion. We meet people who have had long stints of worklessness. I met a woman who hadn't worked for 13 years and we helped her to gain the confidence and the basic digital skills to look for her first job. She became a dinner lady. She thought she had won the pools and gone to heaven. That woman also had seven children. Um, and of course, her new skills, she's now um, sharing. She feels empowered to share that with her children. But we need to have more evidence of how we can focus on those social outcomes first and then recognize the role that digital has to play. I think we have the evidence that we did some digital inclusion and then some social impact happened, but we don't have so much of the evidence of if we want to cure this social issue, what role does digital inclusion have to play? So today I can announce, Big Lottery did it earlier, but you've all been here, so you don't know, that Tinder Foundation, working with Family Fund, Mind and Homeless Link and a number of our hyperlocal community partners um, have won some funding from the Big Lottery to rebuild the lives of people through personalised digital skills training and community-based support called Reboot UK. We're also going to work with Joseph Roundtree Foundation, who won't be getting any funding. I can tell you that over a drink later, if you like. Um, who is going to help us to build that social impact framework because they're a social inclusion organisation, so, so they can also be on this journey of fully understanding that link between the social outcomes and the digital inclusion. And for some of these people that we, you know, sometimes flippantly call the hard to reach or the vulnerable, they're going to be those people who are those 6.3 million people who will be left behind if we do nothing else. And therefore, we absolutely need to understand who they are, what their complex needs are, and how we can help them through digital. So, we need to be more ambitious. Sometimes we're just too polite and too patient. I think we should get angry and we should get organized. And as I said, I think we need a deadline. I'm not here, you know, preaching from my pulpit saying, you know, the Helen Milner show has all the answers and wants to get it all sorted. What I'm saying is, in my wildest dreams, the Tinder Foundation could help two or three million people between now and 2020, and there's 10.5 million people need help. So, and if we don't tackle some of these things that we really don't know the answers to, then actually we're going to fail. And I don't want us to be here in 2020 talking about how we failed. I want us to be standing here in 2020 saying, we set ourselves a deadline, we agreed to work together. We agreed that this was a collaborative plan. It wasn't six-year-olds following a football. We need to be organized. And then the ending of the story, once we've got to 100% by 2020, 
is we'll be here talking about a digital nation that's equal and inclusive for everybody. So please do tweet me if you want to be involved. Thank you very much. Thank you.